So basically, if you've got an FPGA, which you know has um, logic elements, and these logic elements are laid out in the chip, and you can program these logic elements to connect to um, programmable input and output as well. So you've got our programmable input and output sitting on there. And on that too, we've got um, programmable interconnects. So we have these programmable interconnects that each of them is made up of six transistor switches. So we've got six of them laid out in a format like that. And you can have another one there. It's beginning to look alive. And then you have one coming in. Going there. And then you have a switch coming there also to connect. And then you have your inputs. You've got the connections one, two three, four, or not in any particular order. And these switches close to form your interconnect, um, programmable interconnect for you, let's say PI and other things. So the question is, how then do we um, program these FPGAs, which are basically um, chips that we can um, create connections with or just program them to be? All those um, sending me um, links now, well done. At least I know you are um, listening and you are following. So good. It would be a lot easier for us to send messages through that platform. So um, those who have managed to connect to me can also connect to others as well. So basically, we've got these connections um, that we can program to create our, um, our chip for us. And it's slightly different from when we write a code to compile, right? During the compilation process, if you've ever written C++ or Java code before, you have the code that you have written and your lines of code get connected to other library resources, APIs and other things. So there's linking and then eventually you end up with a series of ones and zeros so you can end up with machine code which is just ones and zeros and other things that implement things like add device load so on top of the machine code you have your assembly code sitting on there and this code will be fetched by a processor and then executed by a processor that's different because here we've written the code that is going to be implemented by a physical hardware but with FPGAs, we are actually synthesizing the circuit in that we are creating the circuit connection. So we creating these connections. We creating digital circuits that actually sort of will connect to implement something like the processor for us that can run a code or to implement something like memory for us to implement the actual physical devices so mostly we're going through synthesis right but to get through that level where we synthesize and connect the circuit for us before that mostly after we write our code we will actually simulate it so we run a simulation which is simply if i vary this input from i don't know a zero to a one and it goes into an AND gate for example and then I vary that the other input from zero to one with a bit of delay so I have a one zero at this point what would the output be and the output will show me a graph that so stays zero for that particular point so Z is zero at this point because we've got zero one if it's delayed by one and then eventually gets to one one, then Z will eventually delay by one and eventually get to one one also, for example. So we can simulate and view the output. And this simulation normally is done by a test bed, right? But we'll get back to we'll get to all of that a bit later. So unlike C, C, Java, Python, and all those high-level programming languages that we may have heard of. The VHDO and of course the cousin is very long, right? So very long. Yeah, the cousin is very long. So the 
So earlier we saw that we have VHDL, which is the language we'll be looking at. L is easy to get, guess, so the L will stand for language. The D is descriptive. The H is hardware. So basically, it's a hardware descriptive language, right? So we're creating the physical hardware and we are using a language to describe how the inputs are connected to each other, how the outputs are connected to each other, uh, how the outputs are connected to the gates, and how the, it's basically the hardware is laid out, laid out. So you need to have an understanding of the hardware in order to create the hardware to use VHDL. So it's basically a hardware descriptive language. Now the V actually stands for VLSI, just the V alone. So VLSI, which is very large scale integrated circuits, which simply means that it allows us to create very huge integrated circuits. So it's not necessarily just a single chip that takes maybe several two AND gates and then just connect to the output, right? We can create a lot more with this. And we have a lot of logic elements. We have a lot of programmable interconnects on a single VHD or that we can actually use to create larger circuits. And of course, there is a limit to the number of uh, that you can create depending on the particular FPGA that you are using. And as you've guessed, you can guess already VHDL is used to um, program FPGAs and you have um, another options like the Verilog. These are the two key or two main um, programming languages that are used for hardware descriptive languages. So if we take an example where we have, um, we have let's say Y equals a and S and then or B and not S. So S prime here meaning not S, right? So we can also um, do a bit of manipulation with the combinatorial logic where we can just say, let's find the not gate for the not of all of them. And eventually we simply we can simplify it using and implement it using NAND gates alone. And as we said earlier, with NAND gates alone, you can create virtually any um, digital integrated circuit or digital system, right? So we can have the inverse of A and S, so that's not A, not A and not uh, not A and not S, right? And so you have the not of all of that, and the same we have the uh, not S already, and you find the not of all of them. So it's just simply um, you can put a not gate there to implement all of this. But let's take the simple version, right? Where we have A, we've got S. We can take the NAND, so not A and S, which is this NAND gate there. So let me call it 1. We have the 1 there. And then we have B and S, so NAND S. So we have these two here that's on there, so B, NAND S. But in between that, we have a NOT gate. And of course, we can implement the NOT gate just using this. implement it using just this or we want to just make use of NAND gates right so we take the inverse um, we take the NAND gate and then we just simply feed it into the two inputs where this can be X and Y which simply means we just taking the inverse of that and the last one which is this particular block here block number three can be this so we have sort of have a circuit laid, laid out from the combinatorial logic. And of course, we can implement this without um, NAND gates as well. We just simply AND gates where we can have A, S, to implement our simple half adder. And then we have our AND, 
can have s going in and that comes out to an OR gate going on to the output and we can have our B we take the S have an inverse of that and which is our S inverse and we take our B which is this B go into another AND and that can feed into the OR gate so we just begin to see how circuits can be used to of course to implement logic and other things then we're thinking okay how then as this circuit gets really large it becomes quite difficult to just um, create each of them by circuit connection to buy a chip to connect them or even to lay them out like this so why can't we use a programming language and that's where VHDL comes in and I'll give it a brief right so in brief basically you need to use the library IEEE and from the IEEE library we're making use of the standard logic 116.org this allow us to use get access to things like gates and all those kind of things that we'll be using and almost every VHD or code you write you will need these two lines so make you make note of them and use them um, use them for most of the time of course so basically if you consider you are creating a chip and that chip is your entity so at the moment chip will chip eventually will look like that with some IO pins and then some um, pin heads coming out for power and other things so the keyword to create that particular entity is entity keyword and then you say the entity is right so we give it a name in this particular case we're creating something like we, we are about to create a multiplexer a MOOCs you can call the entity anything you want but in this particular case we chose to call the entity MOOCs multiplexer right so in black or underlined by black will be the keywords right now if you think about it this way how does this the internals of your chip communicate with the external world like things like sensing input and output control and other things that will be going on it's if you think about the internal as um, think about it this way the input, internal being the digital world right so internal is digital world different dimension and then the physical world being the external environment to go from one dimension to another or to go from the digital world to the physical world you need to go through something like a portal right and this portal defines the input and output pane so that takes us to another keyword called the port right so what are these ports the ports are eventually what is going to be your input and output connections it's, it uh, connects you to the physical world so we are going to make use of a pin called pin A so we had our block our entity the entity is called MUX multiplexer we gave it that name entity S that's a keyword so we have A A is an input and standard logic it simply means that it's one line right then we have a b b is an input again standard logic it means that it's one line so the std logic is a keyword the in is a keyword each line or statement is ended by a semicolon just as in c c plus plus then we give another um another input called the select so select in this particular case is also an input and we gave it the name sel or the user chooses the name they want to give it so a b and sel are all user um, selected and then the y on the circuit we have another pin going out as y and y is an output so in in to show an input out to show an output std logic just simply um, says that is um, 
it's just a single wire it's no parallel it's no bus or anything then you notice something right it's like a c structure the last entry doesn't have a semicolon all the entries have semicolon for the port the last entry doesn't but um the end of the port has a semicolon so to actually define the layout of this chip is just basically entity so you need an entity this at the moment is your top level entity then you have the name of the entity and it's going to be s right then in here you need to define the port that you are using so you have a port you've got an opening and you've got an ending and what goes inside the port will define which of these pins to keep or delete more or less you don't delete it physically but basically which of them to activate right now when you finish you need to end that particular entity so in this particular case it will be end name so to close or to finish drawing us our, our circuit in terms of the packaging and how it actually looks like so far used vhdl to create how the chip looks like to create what is the input what is the output on there and the inputs we had a b and then the select switch the select and we said these names we give ourselves the same way we decide what is the input and what is the output but these are keywords we include these blocks to allow us to make use of the logic elements but once we have our entity which is a keyword so entity the name we give the entity is and then we have a port and we need to end that entity all we've done at this point is to create this black um, this black box the internal workings or the internal architecture itself we've not touched it yet we've not really said anything in terms of what the chip does so we just have a chip we just have its um, skeleton sitting there and we are yet to talk about what goes on inside the chip and how it looks like so to start describing what goes on inside the chip we need to use the architecture keyword so we say architecture of something architecture of what that is the question here so architecture of what so we are interested in the architecture of this particular entity remember that we can have like we can have a chip within a chip kind of thing right we can put an and gate in other things but at the moment we are not worried about that we just want to describe the architecture of this entity so to describe what's in the architecture we give the architecture name again that's user selected i'm just going to use the convention of circle for that <coughs> so we have architecture the architecture name so architecture of this particular multiplexer so architecture of the mox is and we'll choose um we will choose what goes into it so at this point we've entered the black box and we're about to describe it we're saying that we're going to make use of some signals the port is the actual pin on the chip signals happen at the internal think about the internal wires within the chip right so we're going to have a signal called an a so inside the black box we have a b and then select and then we've got y but we expect to have a signal called c we expect to have an internal signal called d and these are single wire long so they are just internal things and again we see something special double slash in vhdl is a column so it's completely ignored right by the compiler okay so we plan to use c and d internally but at the moment we've just simply hinted them we've not even connected or use them yet so we don't know how we're going to connect these signals at the moment right so we come to the point where we are actually describing the architecture and to begin describing the architecture we say begin to end describing the architecture we say end the same way we use end multiplexer here we need to end the architecture 
right so we say end arc one so in terms of the raw skeleton of vhdl code it simply looks like entity name of the entity let's make it name end is then you have a port opening ending column then you have your architecture name of arc of then you have entity name which is name end is then you at some point you have begin and architecture and then you end the arc architecture name this is just the basic skeleton of the whole vhdl code and how it looks like right so let's dig into the architecture itself and we have these signals which are internal to the chip let's see how the signals connect to each other right so we say for signal a we use the assignment statement we say signal c is actually equal to a and select so we will take internally we will take a and then we have our select and then we have b and we said this c which we can get rid of now to draw properly so we take a and this and is the and gate so we are describing right we take a and s that will be connected to signal c and c is internal right so it's like a temporal storage i'll put in there but it's just a wire internal wire or internal signal then we say signal d so let me, let me get rid of this one again use a different wire say signal d equals b and not select so i'll take this select i'll connect it to a not gate i'll take the b connect both of them to an and gate then this our y is actually equal to c or d which means we'll take this is d which is also internal and we're going to have an or gate connecting to the d or c so straight away we notice that we have created a circuit that takes the option of either a or b so when s let's draw the whole circuit here we've got a let me put the s there we have a we have the select the select can go in here connect to a and then we have the b you take the inverse of the select they can go in connect to the D and then you have both outputs connecting to an OR gate and from the OR gate you can have your output there which is the Y so we notice here if we do analysis of the circuit if A is 1 and then B is let's say zero if the select is one you are actually saying that the output should be equal to one a because select is one you go a and B so that would be one and the output is equal to one a the same if a is zero 
you've got and select is one you've got one and then zero the output equals zero so the y will become equal to zero so we notice the y is in fact equal to a when let me write when s is equal to one again if s is zero here will be a one here will be a zero so a will not be selected B will be selected or Y will be equal to zero if you see zero one one zero is zero so that Y will be equal to zero in that case or if B is a one then we will have one one and Y will be equal to one so we have Y is equal to B when S is equal to zero so what we have created it's a device called multiplexer or the MOOCs in short where you have the seller switch coming in you've got your A you've got your B coming in and we say when select is once take A when select is zero take B so the select switch is used to toggle which particular input should be equal to the output and that's our multiplexer and we've used VHDL to create such a circuit for us uh, with the layout of how the connection work remember this is called entity internals are called signals right we've got internal signals we use the port to lay out the input and output pins and then the architecture shows the layout of what goes inside it continue the recording from here so as we've implemented we have the s going into um, well this was a for us and that was b so what we've created is a two input to one output multiplex size so that's the way that we can switch between two lines like the train lines right we can switch between two lines so we can either choose for the output to be equal to this or we can choose for the output to be equal to um, this one as well so when we synthesize this right when we synthesize the circuit which we created from the um, from the VHDO code this um, multiplexer is a common circuit so we are the FPGA is likely to have onboard multiplexers so it will make use of the internal components that the vendors have created in the library or just plug it in for us and it will show us the multiplexer being used um, straight away not all circuits are synthesizable so you need to really understand um, how VHD uh, works to write effective code by that I, what I mean by that is that if you write you are creating a circuit right so if you write a code that can't be implemented with a physical device you end up with something that um, is one unusable and then of course two um, at the end of the day um, you can't create the circuit out of it or you can lay it down in physical hardware or you let the hardware guess what you are trying to implement and you wouldn't have a very efficient hardware created for you right so a bit more a, a bit look at uh, more look at some examples for us so we want to see the AND gate we've already seen the assignment statement and we want to see how some basic um, code can be used to create um, AND gates but before we touch on that let's talk about the nature or how VHDL code actually runs right so we have uh, C++ you write the code maybe int main and you write um, x is equal to 1 y equals 2 so you have your integer variables already declared and then you have z equals y plus x and I'm sure you can guess the answer. The answer will be equal, yeah, the value of z after this will be equal to 3. Okay, so C, the way it runs, if I write this in C or Java, 
or any other procedure uh, programming language so sequential one. if I write this x equals um, 1 then I define y then I write z equals y plus x and afterwards I write y equals 1 y equals 2 it will give me an error it will tell me it doesn't know the value of y or even if I didn't declare before y before it say y not declared right but in concurrent programming in concurrent programming language such as VHDL I can write x equals 1 I can write z equals y plus x and later write y equals uh, 2 let's use the right assignment and if I look at the value of z the value of z will be equal to 3 I said what is happening what is happening is that these ones execute code line by line C++ and others go slide by line sequentially right one after the other right it's more or less it's, it's something like takes a step-by-step -step process right so you say process like you keep the keyword process in right then um, VHD or Verilog, they are concurrent programming. It's a, it works as if everything is happening at the same time. And that makes sense, right? When you have wires and other things, if you put a bit of electricity here, there may be some delay due to resistance, but the output it will be instantaneous, right? So everything happens as if they are happening at the same time. And there is a way that you can force uh, you can force sequential execution, which is you can force things to happen in sequence or like within sub blocks. And the way we do that in VHD, and with process, we can execute things bit sequentially. So let's look at how it works. Earlier, we created a multiplexer entity, so we have a MOOC entity. And then we can have another entity maybe that is like maybe an others entity. We can have a lot of entities that are connected to a big chip or embedded within a big chip as components, right? Whatever happens within the entities, concurrent within the entity, but also can be um, concurrent with among the entities as well. So we can use a process, for example, and everything within the, the process happens step by step, but externally is still concurrent with others, right? So this particular process, we have to decide which of these wires or signals go into that particular process for the sequential execution, for example, okay? That um, allow us to use things like if else statement when and other things as well. But remember, this is a hardware descriptive language, so we don't have the luxury of programming everything like with super functions and everything like we do in um, other high level programming languages without a cost. So that's why you need to be careful when it comes to the issue. Right, so let's see the implementation of this. So we've got an entity within the entity, we have some signals. So let's draw a black box for the entity. We have some signals. The signals are A, um, B, and then C. So among them, we want to take A and B and put in the sensitivity list of a process. We call it sensitivity list because it's not like parameters. It looks like parameters of a function. But sensitivity list simply means that whenever A changes, whenever the value of A changes, maybe 0 to 1, 1 to 0, whenever there is a change, we want the process to run. Yeah? Whenever B changes. So a change in B, we want the process to run. So process is sensitive to its input list, right? So if there is a change in B, remember we need to do this to make sure that at least the inputs coming into the process are accounted for. So the process will run whenever they change. So we say the process is, which is this black box there is, and we say begin. 
to start describing this architecture and we say c equals or we assign a and b to c and that's all we implement in just an and gate right and afterwards we need to end the process so we have our uh, process being this and going there and that will give us the signal c let me get rid of this c so that's the circuit we have created um, so far we can look at other things but so far we've made use of entity we've talked about architecture and we've talked about process and we have also mentioned that the other options that we can use uh, to implement um, things as well that's recording started so we did say that earlier we can have several entities as components into a bigger entity and if you think about it we just created an an, an and gate and the and gate was like an entity within an entity but we can use it as a process and the same you think about another process even though we said the execution of of the um let's say lines of code right within a process is um, sequential so we have process one process a process b in between the processes they are um they are not sequential they are more or less um concurrent right so between processes it runs concurrently with the other part of the circuitry right with the other circuits so let's take the architecture of process one so we remember we would have started with the entity and all that right so we are in the architecture of process one and in this case it's the same entity of entity one and again we've got architecture of process two which is the same entity entity one right and we've got an internal signal which is one and then two so we have int one in two being the internal signals and we create the circuit so let's begin with the architecture we have a process which is gate one this is a label how we label things it's just a reference to some bit lines of code right so basically we just say um, the process of, of gate one so this would be um, gate one which is a or c so we call it gate one so it's sensitive to two inputs which is the a and then the c so this is our entity Uh, we take A and C and the uh, actual logic is A or C. So we use an OR gate and we connect it to end one and we end process. Again, we take B and D to be gate two. And it sends, the process is sensitive to B and D and we say S begin into B or D. And we have them um, being separate processes as well. And we have a third process which we take so if we take the the third process which is gate 3 g3 g3 takes this um, integer 1 and integer 2 which were created from here which is the output of gate 1 gate 2 and take them as an input to form an AND gate to give to an output and we say that process that process and that process are concurrent to each other and of course you don't have to use processes this sort of a very inefficient way of defining this uh, vhd or, or writing this vhd or code because at the end of the day they are simple and case we can just use and and all but we still want to use it to understand the concept of process at this particular point in time right so let's look at the other one which is a more efficient way of doing it which is simply saying that we've got um, int one equals or we, this is the assignment process and remember we need to end with the semicolon a or c into equals b or d and then the output being int one into whilst this one will create something like this for us
where there's int1, int2, out, a, c, b, and then d to create that um, circuit for us rather than using just the gates or anything. Okay. So as we mentioned earlier, processes allow sequential execution. Sim simply, we get to use some of the programming languages or the, some of the syntax that we use, um, not exactly the same, some of the statements we use in procedure sequential pro um, programming languages such as C, C++, in things like this, or in VHDL. So mainly because if you don't have sequential execution, if we only have like X concurrent where we say x equals one z equals um, y plus x, and this is the first time we are using y and y equals one. How then do we do if else? Because if we use an if statement on this, then we can test the condition of x first before we run the mess execution. So to use if else statement, you put it in the process. And remember the syntax is the process, the sensitivity list, or the list of signals that needs to change to adjust that process. The word is, and then when you finish, you end process, and then you um, you end up process. And of course, the, the content um, will be like, go into the black box. So that's process, and we have end process, and then we want to begin the same way we begin an architecture and write the content. So we say, begin. Then we say that if, using if statement, then, else, and if, right? It's just a structure of it with a semicolon. So we say if S is equal to one, the same mox logic that we created earlier. Remember we had, um, when s is equal to one, oops. When s was equal to one, the input was the output was connected to a, and when s was zero, the output was connected to b. So we say if s is one, and remember we notice that we have a single bit, so it's going into a code here then so it's if then right assign a to q q is the output right else if s well, else we means if x equals zero then we assign b to the output pretty straightforward so help us to use um, sequential logic and of course this goes into a process it means that we can run it step by step a b and s are signals and um or, and then q also being an output signal for example now here we another alternative of writing it is simply assign q to a when s is equal to one else assign q to b so that's sort of a shorthand of writing it and that creates the same multiplexer circuit that we looked at and remember this is just the internal architecture of it it's not the whole circuitry of the um, of the code So we're looking at how to create a latch, basically take it as a flip-flop without the clock input. And then of course, you, um, later on you can have things like the um, it being sensitive to or synchronized to the clock, right? So when you say that if you have a signal, we have a signal D and then E in bits, and then of, as input bits, and then we've got a signal Q as an output bit, okay? Now, what we want to create, we're saying that if E is equal to one or the enable signal, which is the same as our MOX, similar to the X, if E or S, previously it was S, now it's just E. If the S is equal to one, we want the input Q or the output Q to be equal to D. Same if we take it as a D flip-flop, but without just a clock, we just use an enable signal. So we have something similar coming down. 
Um, so we have the enable signal and then we have the day input and then we've got the output, right? So whatever the state of the D doesn't matter because D is not in the sensitivity list. It's only when the E becomes a one, only when E becomes a one that we latch the output. So we just simply say if E is equal to one, then the output equals D. But D is not in the sensitivity list. So even if this change from one zero whatever, this process will not run. We just wait. It's only sensitive to the E or the process changes only according to the E. And it's good to take make, make note of that in this case because we want this process to run whenever this changes, not whenever the input changes. So the second that it creates for us is like a mux with the um, with with this one grounded to the output. So basically, it doesn't matter whatever is on this pin. It doesn't really matter because we have the output um, only being equal to the D input. So we can use a two to one flip flop um, with the other input graph, set of graph, um, to implement a D flip flop for us. And again, we use the process because it's sequential execution and we want to sensitive to a particular input. Then you have your latch, you want to create a flip flop which is sensitive to a clock. Remember when you just say that um, we have a clock. And we can say uh, on the rising or falling edge of that clock, do something. Okay, so we have rising or falling edge of the clock. We want to do something. So in this case, in the latch, it was just synchronized to a state of zero or one. We use the state of one. But for flip flop, we're saying rising edge or falling edge. We want something done for us. So let me put this there. Okay, so we take two signals. We have a reset, which can reset the state of the flip-flop. And then we have the clock input. We've got our D because we want to implement a D flip-flop. So D coming in there. And then we have a clock, which is going to be similar to this, moving up and down all the time. And then we've got our output. So we say that we want the process to be sensitive to the reset, of course, upon reset, we could set it back, or the main clock, right? So it's either sensitive to the reset or the clock. So whichever moves the work. Then we have end process completing the block, and then where we begin the actual process going into the actual content. Then we say because we're using if else statements, we are making use of process. And we say that if the reset is one, then of course we want to reset the output to zero. Upon reset, set the output to zero. That's all we're doing at this point. Else, this is how we figure out the rising edge of the clock. We say else clock event. So the event is looking for a change in the signal, right? Change state. It's a clock event and clock equals one. This simply means that we are looking for an event, a change, and the clock is going to one, which is the rising edge, where it's moving from zero to one. So we have on the rising edge of the clock, we say that latch the output. So we have the rising edge coming in, and we say on the rising edge, latch the output, yeah? So basically we say on the rising edge, the output Q should be equal to the input. So if this is one, soon as the clock reaches this point, this output becomes one. If this is zero and the clock has not reached that point, it remains the same. But as soon as it reaches that point, that becomes a zero as well. And of course, with flip-flop, we are creating um, some form of memory. So that takes us to um, variables and how we can work with um, variables in um, VHDL. And we will talk about variables being slightly different from signals. And it's actually a really, really good point um, to um, stop on as well. You notice that signal assignment, we used 
the assignment operator for signals where the clock was um, where uh, where particular uh, variable or particular input or internal wire was defined as a signal but variable def um, assignment we use this to differentiate the column and the equal sign to it differentiate them so let's look at a, an example of how we use a variable so we have an instance just being the name or the label of the process so we got a signal called Q and another signal called clock they are just simply STD logic it's not a vector it's just it's logic then we have a variable that we will use as a count we have this variable because we want it updated instantaneously not after the process exit right so for um for signal it will it will it will um, update itself at the end of a loop but for variable it updates itself instantaneously so we're saying that the count variable is an integer um, is an integer variable and it's ranging from 0 to 7 similar to the way that um, variables work in high other uh, right so um, we've got if clock event again the rising edge of the clock if we're looking for the falling edge this would have been zero right so if clock event and clock equals to one then we want to increment the value of count and then of course we will end if and we'll keep counting and we're saying that if um if the count is equal to seven then we want to invert the value of q right so it's just a divide by eight counter so we've got the clock going one two one three four five six seven eight nine so it's going to keep counting the rising edge rising edge rising edge rising edge rising edge all the way down you say one then we'll just keep counting maybe the current state is um it's a one so current state is a one it will stay one two three four five six seven eight then it will just go down so realize that the clock speed is actually much slower now so we've created a divide by eight um, counter so it's just dividing the frequency of it but we use the clock and later we'll find out why we should use a variable for this instead of um, instead of let's say um, a signal so we use a variable instead of a signal for this all right so I'll stop the recording here But I'm just going to go over briefly to show the recording. So all we've looked at is this waveform where we have broken it down into um, the each of the data or the initial input and then how we are controlling it with the up down to reflect on the output. So when up down, um, when the value is one um, and it moves to zero, you are subtracting. When it moves to one, you are adding to it. And the one, the rest on the side explains it. And also we explained the top level entity and how it can be used as a test bed to simulate the entity you have created so basically just making it like instantiating it as a component of a bigger sec where we are using um we've got um the signal keyword and then in here we are using the um, variable keyword okay so we take the uh, same definitions quite similar the same but just that the assignment for variable is different compared to that of a signal so we have straight away initial value where the state of the initial value will be assigned to the reg because it's blocking it straight away it's just taking the right initial value straight away and updating it 
and we're saying if up down and again it will just increment the um, the plus here or it implements the reduction here for you so you don't get any delays in there in terms of the implementation so if we again if we take a process whatever the internal variables are it will just assign it straight away and go to the next step update go to the next step update go to the it doesn't have to wait for the process to finish whilst for using signals you had a process it will just assign whatever initial value is to the signal but it won't update it until the process has finished. That's when it will take the signal value. So signal updated. To feed into the process and update it as such. A very important concept, concept in VHDL programming, right? So let's say you have, you're working with a chip. Like earlier, we actually created a simple AND gate using a uh, process for example so this is a chip and the internals let me have something else for the internal so the internal of the chip is an AND gate that's all there it does right so that's our chip and then let's say you buy another chip, which is probably um, has two or get one AND gate, another an OR gate, and then maybe let's say an exclusive OR gate. They come in. Our chip looks like that and then maybe it's got an output so that's also a slightly different chip as well it takes two inputs maybe another input probably this one is has a NOT gate connected to it just a random circuit we are drawing we are creating and then we can have another chip that simply implements an OR gate, for example. So, in real life, if these chips actually exist, we can basically buy component one, we can buy component two, and then we can buy component three. Then we can So we back up and we're saying we've got a chip which implements a certain circuitry for us. I think the first one was a simple AND gate. We've got another one which implements slightly more. You had OR, you've got AND, and then you've got exclusive OR um, with some form of connections coming up. Yeah. And then we say we have another chip which probably implements an OR gate right and we're saying that in real life we should be able to if this actual chip says this we can buy them as components and then we can wire them together right so we can actually say that we have a bigger circuit which is created by maybe wiring this in the way that we want to have an output to implement bigger circuit for us right the same way we can use the idea of components to form part of a bigger circuit. This is a really good feature when it comes to VHDO because it has something called um, like if I create this particular circuit that is this or I've previously created a circuit I don't know two three years ago a couple of months ago and maybe it implements a processor or something I can make use of this particular component again 
and as my own IP, right? Intellectual property. So the concept of intellectual property course comes in, right? So you can reuse circuits that you've created in the past or circuits that others, other people have created for you and you have the license to use it or they've given you the right to use it. So makes life easy for ourselves. You can have various existing circuits placed as components and then still wire it to become um, new circuits um, for you or form part of a bigger circuit. Okay. The top code is called the top level entity. So that's our top level entity. And then these are called components. The individual circuits are called components. So let's have a look at our example of how to use components. And it's just a matter of how then do we create these circuits in um, VHDL. That's all we're trying to do at the moment. How do we create the circuits in VHDL? So we have our entity, and the entity is uh, multiply um, again. It moves two to one, which is two to one multiplexer. And also we have a port. It's just the same code that we wrote before, but written on a single line, right? Remember before we can have our entity um, name is, and then we have an open brace. Then we have the we have sorry we have is, then we have the port. And then you say open brace, closing brace, laid out in a nicer way. But this puts on one single line just to make it easy to visualize. Okay. Right. So the entity is port select. We have the select D1, D2, D0 um, it being input. So we've got um, D1, D0 as input, both as bit. And then the select. on there and then you have an output um, let me just use this because we know it's a multiplexer and you've got the output Q that's all we've done so far then we have the the architecture of this uh, multiplexer okay now we say we want to make use of the signals. Normally, you can even create these signals as you go. But if you have the block diagram, you get an idea of how your signals look like. So in this particular case, we plan to use signals A, B, and then um, C, potentially connecting to maybe these inputs and output. OK, so we've previously seen the circuit of the um, of the multiplexer so we know how it looks like signals are internal interconnects now we know we can use um, variables also as an option right now we have to think about what the component what components will be using right so the key word to declare your component is basically if you see what is here you have the entity entity name is port and you've got your inputs and outputs or your wires if we replace the name entity with components the rest become the same the name of the component we intend to use so we intend to use an ant gate let's name it as a block but it's actually ant gate and it's taking two inputs so we've got one output two input so here we see it doesn't matter the order of the input and output bit so we've got one output being q and then two inputs being x and y right we've not described what the internal is i just put it there straight away but let's go step by step for another circuit that we draw in here and we notice the same and the name is just become end component so you can pretty much copy and paste the entity of this particular component change the key to keyword um, entity to component and then change the name of the entity at the end and you have your component name the second component is all there's no internal there so it's the same it's got an X 
and then y doesn't matter because they are different components right I've got an output q as well okay then the last one was the not gate so that is also another component not and you have one input which is x and then you have one output which is q right now at this point we simply copied and pasted our entity names and then we've just written them as components and we want to um, by simply just replacing um, some bits of the entity declaration right now we have to show how these are connected of course there will be a bit of code that implements the internals of these ones and that will be the previous VHDL code remember it's just a concept of intellectual property think of it as classes if you actually use um, C++ or other high level programming languages but for now think about it this way the actual architecture of this will of course exist in where you can actually link them to your file or basically you can place them in there as well so to begin with we say we instantiate our components and the word instantiation is used it's like calling a function right but it's not a function of calling a method you call it an instance of a circuit because it's an actual physical device that we create in an instance of yeah so we take the first component which is the AND gate 2 so we take the AND gate we take in the value Q and we are assigning it to A so we have A B and C being internal signals right so we have our A let me clean it a little bit so at least we can see of what we have drawn so far so we've just created um, we've created an instance of an AND gate OR gate and then a NOT gate so these are the circuits we've said we intend to use right the NOT the OR and then the AND and we can of course guess how this architecture looks like at this stage as well and also we can guess how the architecture looks like that stage and then we have our not so these are the instances that we have created said we well, we've created we've created so the components we've imported and said we want to use now we are creating the instance of each of them so we take our signal a and signal A was there and A is being connected to Q of the AND gate so we just take first we have our AND so at this point we're creating the instance now which is this circuit and A goes to what? Uh, or Q is connected to A but let's put um, x of the AND gate where's the AND gate? yes x of the AND gate is connected to D0 so we have um, our D0 which is the input from the chip so this is going all the way to the top level chip and the top level chip is called MOOX21 So D0 comes in and is connected to X or as long as you get the layout right you can just put it straight there but use, you need to use port mapping right but for now let's stick with this and then our Q which is the output will go to A so this is Q different connection there so let's make it clear 
is being connected to A. Then back to the input again, we've got the um, select switch, which is this select. being connected to Y input of the AND gate. So we've got a select going into Y. Should I put the D not outside as well? Let me do it this way anyway. D not goes into that and in there. So, so far, all we've done is created a connection for the AND gate um, to be used internally. Likewise, um, the next instant is the same and two gates, so we can use the same gate more than one. But the label for this particular instance, the first instance was called U1. Now we're creating U2, right? So U2 also takes in input um, D1, and then also it makes use of a signal called um, C, which is this signal. And then it makes use of signal um, B as well. So, so far we've not made use of B, we've not made use of C, but it takes D1. So we're going to take D1 from the top level entity. Let it go in. Once it goes into the internal, D1 is connected to X of the and gate so we have another instance of the and gate and this goes into x of it connected to the one then we have a y which is um, the output of the and gate and that is connected to c let's connect that to c sitting down waiting now, where is the, um, sorry, the Y is an input, so it's an input that connects to C. So Y is an input. So a select input is a Y there. We're going to replace the output with B. So output goes to B. Sitting that waiting, right? So this is X, Y, and then Q. And again, this U1 is also an AND gate. U2 is an AND gate. It's just the same as you can buy the same chip several times and to implement more complex circuits. You can have something like that. So now we take U3, which is a NOT gate, simply that takes our C. And then also um, as an it gives it takes the select input and it gives an output called C. So we can put our NOT gate here if we want, which is this gate. So we take our NOT gate. It's making use of the select switch, so I'm just going to use the green to make it now. Bypass that, connect it to as an input, and we're going to take the output of this NOT gate. So let's say select um, that goes into X of the NOT gate. We're going to take that output and connect it to C. So we have that connection on there right and C goes into the AND gate of um, U2 right the AND gate instance U2 so this one we call U3 it's just a label U4 is an OR gate that takes um, Q so OR gate that goes the other way out to the output so we have um, we have a Q there so where is the Q? It should be big Q, but it doesn't matter because it's not case sensitive. And then we have X. Sorry, we have X that also is assigned to an A. So we've got 
it's x going into an a let's make this big q and the other small q pick it up campaign so x goes to a x of this um all gates goes to a so let's have uh, all gates there x of it go to a and then we have y goes to um, b as well so we have a going into the x of the or gate let me just uh, so we have a and then we take the x input of the OR gate and then we take B and then B is also going into uh, the other input of the OR gate so we just simply say B on that so this is an OR gate B goes into Y and the output is connected to Q of the whole circuit. So we've managed to build our circuit using various components in the um, PHDL circuitry. So these components are existing circuits. We can repeat components just as we've done here and we can use them in various instances of the component to form a bigger circuit. We've got a recording going. So basically, if you remember, we said that we can actually um, use replace this entity name with component and then we'll also say end component and that's when we imported it into um, the previous implementation or the previous VHDO implementation that's what we had there and now um, so basically we've just imported that into the previous or we've imported we've just instantiated them afterwards but after the instantiation the compiler still need to know what is an AND gate so pre we just simply copy and paste our um, gate implementation into the same code or we can even just attach it as a separate file so if we say the architecture which is just the behavior at this moment we're just simply looking at the AND gate we have imported right so we say the behavior of the and two gates we we using process not a very efficient way of um, implementing this but just to show you something please note that is this after thing is not synthesizable it means you can't just implement these delays in actual hardware so we will just avoid them wherever possible okay but you still see it's commonly used in a lot of phd or implementations so we say if x is equal to um, zero and of course and we assign the output q sorry is that a question i see a raise of hand it's not a question okay so we're saying that if the x which is the input is equal to um, zero then we assign the um, output to be zero after three nanoseconds else we assign the output to be equal to y after three nanoseconds so we've got x and then y and then we have um, we have our output Q so we are just saying that if X is 0 when X is 0 the output Q should be equal to 0 after 3 nanoseconds so we just say from this point to that point should be 3 nanoseconds okay and um, with a bit of of course a bit of delay input on there 
else if x is equal to let's say if x is equal to let's say um, 1 then this output should um, come to back to y so let's give y a value of 1 so if y s q and then y so if y's value is 1 throughout then this um, q should come back to y after um, generating uh, more signals so um, which is basically um, after the nanoseconds after the period but we have said that it's not synthesizable so we wouldn't strongly we would strongly not advise using these sort of signals but mostly we use them in test beds anyway to do some timing in the test beds in order to generate the circuitry that we're looking at okay so we've seen this concept in the previous um, slide so now we want to look at how we generate the test bed or our test vector so similar to the idea of components where we said we have um, our top level which is um, the top level circuit we instantiate the top level circuit as part of an, another circuit that will give us the signals that will sort of trigger uh, or basically use give a bit of sensitivity to the inputs of the top level in order to see how the output looks like because you still have to test your phd or code right so let's say if we have an entity which is the text um, vector um, s so this entity is called the text vector in this particular case and it's just the name we are giving it okay normally you want it to be similar to your main entity name right so we've got port a b and c so we've got a b and then of course out So we've got a b and out and we're just simply saying for some architecture is just a simulation and what are we simulating we're simulating my top vector okay so we're just saying that we use a process um, and when we begin the process we simply take an a a zero and assign it to a and we notice that in here because it's a test bed we can actually do some assignment to um, the port pins right so um, sorry a b and c are also out so we can just use an um, assignment of them as well so let me use this uh, let me write it properly um, I did make an error in my writer by default assigning a and b to this so we have a and then b both being outputs as constant corrected so if you assign a zero to this and then a one to that in the beginning and then we just say wait for um one second so we've got our a we've got our b we just simply say a is zero b is one and then we wait for one milliseconds after one milliseconds then a becomes um, one and then b becomes zero again we wait for one milliseconds and then um so after one millisecond, then you just um, alter them, alternate them. Then we wait for three milliseconds, so we can just wait a bit longer um, before we go back to one and then we go back to zero. So basically we just use these, um, we can use these wait and also after to change the, or to create our, signals that we will use a waveform that we use to test our top level entity so we just give them a variation of ones and zeros so we can actually see how they look like so let's see how we can use the test bed notice we've got two components here You've got the test vector which we just implemented and then we've got the AND gate uh, which which 
and two gates which we implemented um, previously as well in the past two slides and then we've got the actual test bench also sitting there right so let's have a test bench of this um well basically it has no ports right it's just taking no input it's a black box going to have some internal signals that we're going to connect it to our chip which also will have internal signals on there because this chip has inputs and outputs, okay? So before we had our A, which probably look like this, and then we had our B, which probably look like that in terms of waveform for the test vector. So we can actually take um, we say we have the architecture going down, so we take the test output, which is bit. We have D1, D2, um, okay, internal signals, um, and then also we have A and then B, and then in terms of the actual AND gate, we've got the Q being the output. Let me use the black ink to make it clear. So we actually have the Q being the output, and then we've got x and then we have y so let me draw that here to make it clear we've got q and then we've got x and then y coming in that's for our and gate and the and gate we calling it or instantiating it as dut Okay, so if we take our AND gate, we're taking the, um, assigning it to the test output, and we are test output is an internal signal, okay? So we are assigning Q to the test output. So we take Q, assign it to the test output. And then we are taking our X and we are assigning it to D1. So S goes to D1. And then our Y will go to um, D2. But we notice that D1, D2 are coming from this signal A and B. So we have signal A goes to D1 and then B goes to D2 where A varies like that as the waveform and then B has this waveform so we're giving some sort of sensitivity to this or we just basically um, giving a waveform input using the test bed and it's just a way that we can actually test the functionality of our circuit and we connect that to the DUT and we have our test bed chip that looks like this not output into anything but we can use a compilers to get access to these particular pins to see how they behave with this particular waveform so so far that's all we've created at this point to see um, how the wiring looks like and with um, particular waveforms yeah That takes us to a very important concept called finite state machine. So let's see how we implement it. Remember we had our S1 or state zero, not, not. And then we have it being implement, um, dependent on one. We have our S2 and then we have our S3. So this was zero, one, 
and this was one zero and then s4 is not used so to move from s1 to s2 or s3 back to s1 the value of x needs to be one right and we say when we are in s2 we can come back to s1 if the value of x drops to zero same we can go back if the value of x drops and we can go back if x drops that's sort of the state diagram that we have at the moment let me use the arrows to show where we are going so let's see how we implement it in vhdl import our library so now we're going back to writing the full code so we import our ieee library and from there we can use the ieee um, standard logic um, 116.0 which is all the logic gates that we give us access to then um, we've got our entity name right so the entity name is uh, mod3 right. count mod3 yeah that's the entity and the entity takes into um, our x as an input it takes the clock and also it has the reset button and then it's got the output value right so the input x is a single bit the output um, the clock is single bit the reset single bit but the output is a two bit um, integer. So, like the output at S1 is 00, zero. the output at S2 is zero, 01, the output at S3 is 10. So, that's two bit wide. And this actually should be out STD logic vector. It's a logic vector because it's not it's a vector it's not just a single bit right it's a logic vector okay so that's is correct and again we add that entity same name as that and we say we want to create the final state machine right as an architecture but to do that what um, we do is also we create sort of create our own data type by using like state type so we just create our own type so we use a keyword called type we give it a name and then the type is this so what are the possible states that we can use I think it was S0 it doesn't matter we have our S0, S1, S2, S3 S3 is previously S4 which was not used Mm -hmm. at the moment we've not defined what these particular state uh, types um, do but just take it as, as if it's a template right and we're going to use the signals for one the next state and then two the current state that we are in and then three um, we will actually name it using them as state types so if you think about it next state is actually still s0 s1 s2 s3 so next state can be either of these right whilst the current state also is of the same type right so it's of that data type so current state is also s0 s1 s2 s3 so you get these options that you can use for each of the states as well then we say okay so in that case we do a begin and once we um, actually begin we can just say we just begin in the architecture okay so with the explanation of the architecture again we've lost okay so if you realize so in the when the state is zero so we're looking at the current state at this particular moment so the case of the current state is initially remember this process is simply changing the value of the current state the next state becomes the current state okay so if it is s naught 
so where we have s naught we're looking at the implementation of this so we have s naught the value of the output should be equal to zero zero now we are still in s naught we've set the value and we're saying that if x is equal to zero then the next stage should be remember we have s naught s1 s2 s3 where we are not using s3 so if the value of x which we are putting into this process is equal to zero what we should do is to go back right so if x is equal to zero um, we want to go back to s2 then we're saying that um, else if x is equal to one then we want to go to s1 so that's the stage and that's the state that's all we've done at the moment and we end if otherwise if the value of the current state is s1 then we say we set the value or the output to one so we set the output to zero one and again we check this is x equal to one again we check if s1 is equal to um if that x the value of x is zero then go back else if s is equal to one then go to s2 which is what we have at this point now the final state to look at is if the current state is s2 so in s2 the first thing we do is set the output to one zero because that's what it's using a standard state diagram but that's what the circuitry show us and it says we should actually implement this logic so in this particular case um the next state we are pushing to if s is um zero is to go back to state s1 or we are going to state s naught so the one that we are using say we shouldn't be able to have any others so we com um, consider other cases so we use the others to consider all possible possible inputs and that can be anything that will fluctuate on the input so we just say for others we will set it to an error and we just say it's an error and then we still reset it back to um zero remember we've got a reset in the, the current state running on the and current states in this particular case feed into this particular process because we've got current state feed, feed in there that should take care of um state diagrams for us and understanding how um, state diagrams work again i'll pause on here so we have um loop statement um it's just like for loop and other things so it just contains a sequence of statements which are supposed to be repeated so like um doing repetition repetitions more or less so you have you test like let's say a condition and you have a case where you continue the condition or maybe you execute as you execute something if it is a yes um, if that condition is not met then you execute something and call back, go back and then keep executing that so maybe let's say things like is x um, greater than 10 for example and then you just do x equals x plus one it's just an example to let you see how loops work then you keep um repeating these statements again and again and again and again okay so the statement will list the condition for repeating the sequences as we've done in this case of example um, um, which spe or specifies a number of iterations that sh it should run 
all right the number of iteration of course should be known um, at the compile time otherwise you end up with infinite loops and other things so the loop statement can be several different types of form it depends on the iteration that we are using and of course I'm proceeding for the word uh, with the word loop let's see how it looks like so we want to implement a loop using the while statement so we have an example of a pulse signal the trigger um, produces four consecutive cycles of the clock signal so let's look into this and see how it works right so we've got a signal which is a bit and just simply one bit and then we've got another for the clock We've got another signal, which is the trigger signal. And then we have, um, of course, a variable called positive. And that variable is also, these are um, variable, variable positive. That variable is also going to um, increase by one, we'll assign it to one. So we've got a variable, let's say positive. And that's going to be one so let's see how it works right so we've got a label called clock four and the process is uh, sensitive to the trigger which is this signal the process is sensitive to that and we say if that trigger is equal to one then we want to um, have so if it is equal to one, we just want to have a variable called an i, which is the positive, sorry, I had, it's just a positive number, that's the data type, sorry. So we've got an i, um, which is a positive data type, and then we're just incrementing i by one. So we say that if that trigger goes from, it becomes one, if the trigger value is one, then we just say i equals i plus one. So we have i, and then I will move from maybe one to two and keep going on. Then we say while, so we have a label using the while loop. We say while the value of i is less than or equal to eight, we want to again loop, right? It's just followed by loop sometimes. We just say in that particular case, then we say we just do a clock and then we say, um, we invert the clock so it's not gate so we just toggle the clock keep toggling the clock for each time the trigger comes in after five nanoseconds until we get to the point where um, the i value is less than um, is greater than eight and then we'll stop or the clock value uh, the value that we've set for I on here becomes more than eight then we stop at that point so let's see what we've implemented we have um, we can of course assign an output based on this number of uh, way of counting the clock signal or just assigning the clock signal to produce um, division and other things or frequency other things like the standard C programming stuff because um, the compiler sort of have to guess the circuitry for you and normally the more combinatorial your circuit is the stronger control you have in terms of how the register transfer level looks like right so again we do the same we have a trigger and then we say if the trigger equals one the same circuit anyway but we use a for loop in this particular case and then we say for one two eight which means before we had a while is less than or equal to now it's a four one two eight and we are using um a variable for the i because we expect it to be updating itself right and in that same case um, we just um, implement the same circuit but this is just the syntax for the for loop so we look at what has been implemented um, for us using the code that we just created and other things and where where the um, where some of the cautions come in to play right so we're just saying um, in synthesizing we're translating the code 
to actual circuits for us yeah so so far we've been drawing different circuits showing how the circuits connect to each other showing the blocks because we're creating actual hardware with written code but we don't want the compiler to keep guessing for us so basically translate the vhdl code um, to a circuit which is also called the netlist right it's just think about the way that the circuit is laid out right and of course this is made up of interconnections of various components that are available on the uh, vendor library so it's just components available to us that we are taking into uh, um, consideration so you have to know especially like while loops for loops those kind of things high level programmable language programming languages slide and all those things making like a bulk of about 90 percent of the vhd or code is not synthesizable so if you can't really generate a proper um, hardware implementation of it then you can't really predict the timing of your circuit and your circuit may actually behave in a way that you wouldn't want so for example we've got this up down and then the interval implementation making use of something like an ad maybe it's just going to use an adder but you can't really predict what goes into this particular ad um, so it's just using some particular symbols um, for you if it is just simply using a nice adder okay that's great but then you could actually go inside it to also view how the components are laid out you can do your initial timing analysis and other things so it becomes a lot easier to tell and you're thinking what is this that what is so this thing sort of happens when you let the compiler do the guessing for you by using extremely high level uh, programming language and this quartus here is a software that allow us it's, um, we used to be owned by um, in, uh, Altera, now owned by Intel. So it used to be owned by Altera, now it's owned by Intel, because Intel purchased the company. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to change by the time you're listening to this or you're watching this. Um, but mainly um, with this software, you can also compile and synthesize your VHDO code, and you can automatically generate the RTL that you can use to. Uh, look at how the circuitry looks like and do some initial analysis as well right so let's look at simulators um, versus a synthesizer right so the simulator um, follows the um, the strict VHD rules it does not produce the net list um, so simulator is always right simulator will just run um, look at the input so if you say you have an AND gate it will just look at the input like triggered based on the test bench or waveform wave and then let's say this is input A and that's input B then we can have B with delayed so as we already see this is zero, 01 Zero one, zero one, zero one, zero, and this is zero zero one one, zero zero one one, as predicted in that sense. Okay, so we've got that, and we're saying, okay, in simulation, how does the output look like? And we can do something called functional simulation. That is just simulation, simulating the function of the FPGA without, um, without or the code the VHD or code, but it's basically the FPGA without any timing analysis. That we we're not looking at delays or anything. So if this is an AND gate, then the output is going to look like this. So where we have zero zero the output will be zero so this is x and then again another zero and at this point both of them become a one so the output will become a one and it will become a zero again at this point both of them become a one and will go all the way to that so this is just looking at sort of the function how it behaves so we're just simulating the output it's always right that's the simulator However, after synthesizing the net list, which is where we just create the actual physical circuit, 
which is after the mouth pin so we place it on the FPGA here we've not placed it on we just we basically simulating the function uh, simulation shows the actual circuit behavior which is just that you've created the actual physical hardware at this point so um, you can have the output being different from the simulation results so um, the synthesizer can go wrong so let's say if you've created a really complex circuit and with several um, levels of inputs going on there um, outputs like so many different um, devices coming in there and then some intertwine and it gets really large I mean large this is simplified version of a potentially uh, complex circuit and let's say the delays on there between these two points are extremely too high and you just want an output right from here to there you are likely to have this signal wrong because these delays need to overlap or uh, the, the timing needs to be right in order to get your instantaneous um, data on the output because these devices of course each of them made of transistors have different um, delay um, impacts that can it can happen on them so we've seen we've we've simulated We've done the post mapping, we've done a bit of the placement, we want to fit the circuit onto the FPGA itself. Right, and hopefully this is the last slide, so we'll be happy, right? So fitting, um, we use a fitting tool, you can make use of like fitting, fitting tool of um, some like Xilinx from Xilinx or um, Quartus. Um, so it uses the netlist that is generated or the circuit that is generated by the synthesizer or you've got a gate level implementation or the RTL and then you place that on a chip. Remember you've got several logic elements you've got various logic elements with programmable interconnect which is just the circuitry and then you are placing them so maybe you have a simple adder here that you can use for the other circuit or you can put several of them together and then we can create the right connections to make it look uh, implement the circuit and connect to the right um, pin output for example so basically you just fit the netlist on there and then we have another key term which is the post fit which where we do um, the timing right so the simulation reflects only the combined reality of the Netflix and the way that all components in their interconnects were placed on their silicon. So basically once you have some, maybe you can have one element placed there, another element placed there, and then we create the internet. But after we do the post fit, we can have a good idea of what the timing really looks like right okay so this is the closest um when you can get to a real circuit um where you actually um wire or maybe so that the components or maybe just implement the actual physical um chip for yourself so we've done quite well that brings us sort of the close to an overview of the hdl all together where we look at various components and i'll bring the recording to a pause here